Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Otter. I'm from Hewlett Packard Enterprise and, and one of the uh, co chairs of the DMTF Redfish Forum. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, today's uh, webinar going through the Redfish 2022.3 uh, release bundles. Uh, with me, uh, as, as always, is uh, Michael Ranieri from Dell. Mike, say hi. Hi, I'm Mike Ranieri from Dell, as Jeff just said, and uh, likewise, I'm the, the other co chair of the Redfish Forum. And also on the call day, we have uh, uh, to talk about uh, some specific uh, new functionality in this release is uh, John Mayfield, please. John, say hi. Hi, everyone. I'm John Mayfield from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and uh, I am the chair of the Fabrics Task Force in the DMTF. Great. Uh, so uh, before we get started, just to note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, that recording will be made available to the public uh, via the uh, DMTF uh, channel on YouTube. Uh, and the link is there on the page. Uh, before we get into the details of the lease, uh, let's, uh, let me run, run through a quick polling question. Uh, we want to know uh, what, your, uh, uh, what your familiarity was uh, or sorry, what your interest is in uh, in Redfish? If you're, uh, uh, are you an end user? Uh, are you a developer of a service or a client software? Uh, and I think in the one of our new choices here was we want to know if you were uh, if you were doing any development uh, with uh, Redfish device enablement. So, uh, so we'll give you just a a minute or so here to answer that question. That should do it. All right, so it's, it should be a simple question. So Shannon, let's see the uh, let's see the results of that poll. Okay, so we have uh, uh, once again, there's a, uh, always a always a smattering of folks. We've got uh, uh, about two thirds of you are working on uh, Redfish implementations on a product, uh, and uh, good to see that we've got also folks uh, writing uh, client software uh, that that will be using the standard. Uh, and hopefully, the person that's uh, somewhat confused thinks this is a fishing show will still uh, learn something, and uh, you know, and we can maybe give some some tips later. <laughs> so, okay, and so with that, uh, let's jump into the material. The topic for today is uh, the Redfish release 2022.3. So that's the third release uh, of this year, uh, which was made available uh, at the end of the December uh, as after approval by the uh, DMTF Redfish Forum. In this release, there were actually uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of pieces that were touched, uh, a lot of minor changes. Uh, but so I'll, we'll just highlight kind of the 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 you know the the large fish in this uh, in this bundle. Uh, in the uh, and we'll go into de some of the details here as well. So uh, there were two uh, revisions of the Redfish specification. Uh, there was a uh, just an errata release that had a, a number of clarifications, uh, especially around uh, things like uh, the use of UUID formats and making sure that uh, that, that what we showed uh, in the spec was uh, was matching what was uh, in the schema files. The schema files were all correct. The I believe some of the examples in the specification didn't necessarily match up. Uh, to the schema, and so uh, luckily the schema is the one that was correct. Uh, and a few other uh, clarifications there. Um, the uh, the the other the other release of the spec is is version one point seventeen. Uh, so this is uh, new functionality. Uh, uh, two pieces. Uh, the first, and we'll go into some details about this, is support for multi-factor authentication uh, and for client-side certificates uh, as part of the authentication process uh, for you know for Redfish sessions. Uh, there was also uh, annotations uh, added to the schemas to allow us to uh, to mark uh, URI patterns as deprecated. Uh, and also to uh, expose uh, what are what are called write-only properties uh, and using the uh, uh, some of the facilities already supported by the schema uh, the schema languages. Uh, write-only properties are things like uh, passwords or other sensitive data where uh, the user is able to set that uh, set them. They're able to write them, but on read they are returned as null in our payloads. So this is not a new functionality for us, uh, but we're just taking advantage of uh, of the support within the schema languages to to surface that for uh, for any downstream tools or code generation. Uh, the uh, Redfish interoperability profile specification was also revised, and we'll go into some details here to add. Uh, some new functionality that will hopefully uh, make it easier to develop uh, richer uh, profiles with uh, with less effort on the on the the author's uh, perspective. Uh, 
And then getting into the uh, the schema and the registries, uh, we've got a, a lot of stuff in the schema bundle. Uh, there were 40 uh, uh, minor revisions made to schemas, uh, and there were three new schemas. Uh, and John is here to, to, to talk about the CXL support, so you'll, we'll get into that. Uh, and then the other two new schemas are, are involved with uh, heating devices or heaters uh, in, in, in included in, in hardware chassis. Uh, the uh, the other uh, piece of bundle uh, is the Redfish uh, message registry bundles. So uh, those there was some minor additions there, uh, just to the base message registry to add uh, uh, just just fixing some missing messages that, uh, that just didn't have some coverage uh, where for consistency. So we added some. Uh, some new messages there for uh, query parameter unsupported, uh, and then one uh, one new one for uh, for authentication token required, which is uh, which is part of the uh, the multi-factor authentication support. Uh, so as always, all of that support is available uh, for download at the, uh, the the main site for uh, for all the Redfish information, and that's uh, on the the, the uh, dmtf.org/standards/slash uh, uh, Redfish, and there's, I can, I've got my pointer ranking. Uh, so along with all of our releases, uh, we also update uh, a set of uh, guide documentation uh, that take the contents of our, uh, of our schema, schema and our registry uh, files and converts them into uh, human readable or at least more human friendly form uh, for, you know, for, for folks to, to read and understand. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, two forms of the, uh, of the schema files. Uh, the first is the, the one intended for, really for end users that's called the Red for, Redfish Resource and Schema Guide. Uh, this presents uh, all the content and examples for every possible Redfish resource and, and, and the schemas that back them. Uh, the recently renamed uh, the Redfish data model specification is, uh, is, includes the same information from the, the resource guide, uh, but also includes what's called the long description or the normative text uh, that backs up uh, from a spec language perspective, uh, everything in the uh, uh, everything in those uh, schema definitions as well. So this is really intended for uh, service and client side developers. But if you're if you're trying to do programmatic uh, pieces, either either producing or consuming, uh, this will show you you know what the real requirements are. All as we as we say in the standards groups, you know, it's it's all the shall statements. Uh, and so uh, where where this is intended to be a little more friendly of the hey, I'm just trying to to use this. Uh, you know, and I'm relying on people to follow the specifications. The uh, message registry guide uh, does effectively the same uh, process with our message registry files and then produces those into table forms to make them uh, easier to peruse. Uh, this includes all the all the relevant information because the 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 amount of data that you need to explain the uh, explain the messages and implement them are are pretty much the same. So all of that all of that data is included. Uh, and then lastly, if you're uh, if you're creating uh, your own uh, OEM schemas or or trying to to do anything in the standards work, uh, we have a, a, effectively an index uh, to property names uh, so that you can use this for either uh, just quick reference for finding out what, what exactly a particular property means, especially if you don't have the context of, of what schema it came from. Uh, but, and that can also help you if you're, if you're crafting your own things to see uh, if you want to match what we have already used uh, for any particular terminology or, uh, or just like to follow and match the style. All right, so before we move on, there's another polling question. And so as we dive in, uh, we just want to see what your what is your familiarity uh, with the Redfish? Is this uh, is this your first uh, 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 first first glance at it? You've been doing it for years, or or if you just figured out you were, that this is not a fishing show, uh, then I, I think I know what your answer is going to be. Uh, but that hopefully is a real simple one. So we'll just give you a few seconds there. Uh, and Shannon, that should give us enough time. All right, well, we've got uh, about two, about 60% uh, uh, saying that they've used uh, using it and have written uh, uh, Redfish enabled code, which is great. And we've got one person or two, I'm sorry, we have two folks that are just getting started. So again, welcome. And we hope that you'll stick around with the uh, uh, with our round table to get any, uh, any of your other uh, you know, first uh, uh, you know, first questions answered. 
and also glad to see that we've got folks that have uh, started using have been using Redfish for actually performing management tasks. So that's that's the that's that's why we're doing all this. So it's uh, we're not uh, not here for not here for fun. We really want to see uh, folks be able to accomplish something. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to to John Mayfield that'll take us through the new support for CXL. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. So. Um... We've added support for the Compute Express link in uh, the DMTF models. Um, the Compute Express link is defined by the Compute Express link consortium, um, which is uh, it's based on the PCI Express physical layer, providing um, a cache coherent interconnect with the processor and add some uh, additional protocols on top of PCI Express uh, for that cache coherent interconnect. Um, it supports three different device types. Um, so type one, which is uh, caching devices or accelerators um, like a smart NIC. Um, type two devices are uh, accelerators that have memory, accessible memory. And then uh, type three uh, devices are memory buffers. Uh, so our uh, data model was extended through the DMTF Alliance partnership with the CXL consortium. And if you're looking for more information on the Compute Express link, you can uh, visit the ComputeExpressLink.org website um, uh, to get to the consortium material. Um, so we've included models for both CXL devices and CXL-based fabrics. Um, the devices are described in the co computer system and chassis models, uh, where using PCIe devices uh, and addition of processors in chassis allow us to describe local and remote devices, so accelerators and memory devices. And then, then the computer system, um, which describes the host's connection to that CXL device. Um, a processor that's in chassis um, and computer system can show the connection to the local remote accelerator. And uh, memory um, and computer system can show local or, or remote CXL memory buffers that are attached to that computer system. Uh, so CXL-based fabrics are described in the fabrics model, uh, which uses um, a lot of the models that we already have today, um, which shows embedded and remote CXL switches. Uh, and then ports will show connectivity to CXL devices connected through those switches. And then connections will show how hosts are connected to remote CXL resources. And we do have additional training material that is uh, currently being developed inside the DMTF. Next slide. Uh, here is a picture of the model for a type three memory buffer, which shows um, on the uh, right-hand side under chassis, um, we've got a fabric adapter and uh, which is it has a port that will connect to a switch that is in fabrics and then we've got pcie devices which um, will have a pcie function for a cxl device and then we've added the cxl logical device uh, to support cxl's multiple logical device devices <laughs> mld devices and then we have uh, memory domains and memory under chassis where um, that will describe the memory buffers for those CXL devices. And then memory chunks, which are regions of memory that are assignable to a computer system. And then way over on the left side under system, right, we've got that memory and um, the remote CXL device memory. It's described there. And then um, down below, we've got processors and we've got a CXL uh, port coming off of a processor. And that port will connect directly to a CXL switch. And 
And that's kind of an overview of uh, a remote type three CXL device. I think we'll move on to Mike here. All right, great. Thank you, John. Uh, so uh, it's worth noting a few other new functional areas of the spec um, that, uh, that need a little further explanation. So uh, first of all, uh, one of the, the new pieces of functionality we're adding is multi-factor authentication support as part of the standard. Uh, and so the way we've done this is we first added in a new property to account service called multi-factor auth. And this is where you, a client can go through to, to configure their multi-factor authentication uh, um, uh, capabilities. So uh, today we've, uh, we have RSA Secure ID, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, and client certificate-based authentication. So when, when an administrator goes in and enables uh, multi-factor auth for, uh, for these types of uh, use cases, uh, HTTP base, basic authentication is no longer available for accounts that are configured to use multi-factor authentication. And so this means that you would be required to use regular sessions or potentially OEM types of, of methods for performing authentication. Uh, specifically for RSA Security, Google Authenticator, and Microsoft Authenticator, uh, there is a new token property that must be specified by the uh, by the client when creating the, the Redfish session. So when you do a post to the session collection to create your, your Redfish session, you normally provide a username and password. There's now a third property for that uh, uh, one-time token that, uh, um, that, is, that, that is then validated by the service to say, yes, this is a valid token that goes with a valid username and password. Uh, and then specifically for client certificate authentication, uh, the expectation here is clients will provide their identity certificates uh, during uh, TLS handshakings. And so this, this leaves uh, the door open for uh, uh, what is uh, sometimes called a TLS mutual authentication. So when a client provides that um, identity certificate, the service then validates that uh, certificate uh, against a known uh, CA certificate and also uh, uh, tries to do matching of that certificate with, with one or more certificates on, on a given user account. And so if the, uh, so as a first pass, if the, um, if the certificate is trusted, it then goes uh, based on uh, how it uh, maps back up to a, a CA certificate, uh, and then it matches a, a known certificate, the request can go through, but otherwise the, um, the handshaking uh, at the TLS level will stop uh, if, if needed and then give a, uh, uh, I think it's a 401 unauthenticated response if needed. All right, next slide, please. Uh, the other new functional area is, is really more just modeling uh, it to show, uh, to represent uh, newer types of devices that we're seeing in systems. Uh, so showing heaters and heater metrics. And so this is kind of analogous to a, to a fan where a fan cools a system, but in some extreme cases, uh, depending on the environment of the system, you may need to act to actively heat components to bring them up to a uh, to normal operating range. And so there are there are uh, some system designs that have active heaters to to do this to provide this capability. And it's uh, follows the the same type of modeling pattern we do with other devices within the um, uh, within the power and thermal subsystems, where you have your uh, your uh, resource that represents the device itself. So in this in this case, we have a heater collection off the of thermal subsystem, like we do with a, a fan collection off of the thermal subsystem. And so you have a heater resource to represent a single heater. And then underneath that, you have metrics for the heater and also assembly information for the heater. Uh, next slide, please. So. Uh, we, we also updated the Redfish interoperability profile specification. Uh, we added some new enhancements to help uh, aid with the construction of, uh, of profiles. Uh, we, we've been learning that um, the conditional requirements, semantics, and profiles can get a bit uh, awkward over time, especially as new devices are introduced and uh, that might have to require creating a lot of different types of conditional requirements, which can be a bit of a problem. So uh, we introduced this new concept of a use case to the profile. And so this allows you to, uh, at, at the resource level, specify sets of use cases um, based on a certain criteria of resource. And so as a profile writer, you can say, 
I want, if I detect this property in, uh, in the resource and it has this value, I want to apply these the pl uh, apply this uh, profile construct, and so each use case is structured that way. So that way, you can eliminate the need for conditional requirements, and then more concisely at the top level, call out what it is you're really trying to describe. And so, uh, NVDIM and DRAM based memory devices are, are, are very good example where um, you know when you have a, a typical DIM inserted that's just all DRAM based, you have your your normal uh, properties like uh, uh, how much memory do you have, your manufacturer, your model, serial number, uh, health and status. But with NVDIM, you might have uh, a dozen additional properties that are all very NVDIM specific. And so th this allows you to avoid that a dozen extra conditional requirements. The, the next uh, enhancement was to add uh, traceability for uh, for showing deprecated properties and how to map things together. And so we added the new terms that replaces and replace by to express in the profile that, yes, this property is no longer required. And if you have this newer property, uh, you can satisfy my functional requirements. You can also conversely say, you know, yes, we have this newer property, but as long as you at least have the old one, that's good. And so these annotations allow you to avoid specifying again uh, conditional requirements about when one is present versus the other. This, this lets you uh, just simply say, I need one of these things. As long as you have one or the other, that's great. Having the newer one is preferred. Uh, having both is okay as well. All right, uh, lastly, we want to uh, uh, advertise uh, some of the conformance tools that, that we have available. Um, uh, apparently, we've we've received feedback that it's not well known, and so we'd like to we start publicizing uh, uh, more about the uh, the different tools that we have. And so, really, would like folks to, uh, especially service implementers, to to use uh, the three tools we have up on the screen. So the first one is the, the Redfish Protocol Validator. This does all the lower order protocol checking of your Redfish service. So, do you support the right HTTP headers? Do you handle certain response conditions correctly. Um, so very high level, outs all outside the data model types of testing. Then we have the Redfish Service Validator, which uh, will do a scan of the entire Redfish service and start doing the uh, comparison of all the responses against their schema definitions. And so if you have things like uh, unknown properties, you'll get, you'll get errors in your, in your validation to say, you know, this property is not defined in schema or the data type you're using for this property doesn't match the schema definition. And then lastly, we have the Redfish Interop Validator, which is used to validate a service against a known profile. And the profile contains a sets of requirements that, a, that an end user may want to enforce on their service. Organizations like OCP have their own uh, profiles to say, you know, in order to, be, to meet OCP uh, management criteria, you need to pass our Redfish profile. And other organizations can like, likewise create their own profiles to document their requirements for Redfish and acceptance in their organizations. All right, next slide. Uh, and so actually here, I'll pass it back to Jeff to go through the, uh, the minor versions. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, and so, yeah, as we said at the, at the top, uh, there were 40 uh, minor, uh, revisions made to schema in this release. Uh, so I'm not going to go through those in uh, in the gory detail. Uh, the full list of of, of all of these uh, additions and, and improvements uh, are listed in the uh, readme that's contained within the uh, uh, the schema bundle or DSP 8010. Uh, so I'll, I'll skim through the the ones that have good highlight the highlights that have uh, uh, that recognize you know new new uh, uh, new functionality. Uh, so we'll kind of scan through these uh, in uh, it, and some of these will, are pretty obvious now that given what uh, Mike and John have already gone through. So you'll see uh, a smattering of new properties to support either the CXL models or the uh, uh, or the other protocol functionalities like uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, so you'll see that kind of throughout. So I'll, I'll just touch on some of those uh, some some highlights to bring out uh, an aggregation source uh, and, a, and a few other places. Uh, there were a, a number of properties uh, that all relate to uh, uh, to SSH based connections uh, and this is you'll see this a few times uh, in the in this release uh, where uh, 
where we have support added uh, in enumerations or in properties uh, for configuring protocols that are not part of the Redfish uh, standard. So SSH is not uh, part of Redfish, uh, but uh, but you can configure uh, that that any uh, these SSH connections or other types of you know SSH related functionality like the identity key pairs. Uh, that are needed to make that feature work, uh, but you can perform those actions and perform all that that those management t uh, tasks uh, through the Redfish interface. This is a, a kind of a typical thing uh, as we've uh, as the standard has advanced, and uh, you know folks want to make all of their configuration uh, you know operations all run through uh, the the you know the single standard for uh, for you know for configuring things. Uh, but you know, but once once configured, well, then things like SNMP and SSH uh, are you know are functional, but are, but at that point are are not really you know, anything to do with uh, the Redfish interface. Uh, and, as, and as John mentioned, there's there's links now uh, to uh, processors from uh, chassis, and uh, you'll see a few other pieces in memory uh, of links. Uh, there, uh, the the uh, deprecation of intrusion sensor number. This is just kind of a vestige, and now some confusing text uh, because of the because Redfish has a sensor model, and this is actually a a, a piece that comes from from very early uh, uh, very early uh, uh, intrusion detection, and and perhaps even the IPMI definitions for that. Uh, there were some uh, uh, in in KMIP servers, uh, and that again another one of these uh, you know being able to configure an external service. Or you know, something external to the Redfish uh, standard, uh, but just some more details there for you know the, for how the how the cache is handled uh, for for KMAP. Uh tunneling protocol uh, again you know more 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 things to describe uh, alternate ways to to connect to uh, to aggregation uh, components. Uh, let's see uh, in Drive this was actually uh, some some good new uh, functionality uh, as as we as we want. Uh, uh, items like drive that where there can be a physical slot or a drive bay uh, that is a consumable resource. Uh, we we have a concept in Redfish called an absent resource, and what that shows is the is the state property uh, when it has a. Uh, uh, a value of absent uh, that indicates that there is, you know, there's no drive present, but this, but but what is left behind is an empty drive bay. Uh, so that still has a location information and may have some capabilities, like you know, what what kind of protocols does that does that drive bay support, and, and so on. You'll see the same concepts in things like uh, dim sockets or power supply or fan bays uh, or processor sockets. Uh, so as part of that, what we, we want to do is be able to describe. Uh, that 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 uh, um, that capacity. Uh, so we have added new properties here in in two uh, in both aspects here. The slot form factor. So describing really what the physical uh, you know size of that drive bay is if if it if if such a if it's uh, that kind of implementation. Uh, and then if obviously if there's a drive installed, well then what you would also want to know what the drive's form factor is. Uh, and then the while the the drive already described its protocols, well, that was the ones that the drive supported. But we added a, an additional one to show what are the capable protocols for this this slot. Uh, and, and using using the slot term, as I, I I say drive bay, but they, you know you you all know what we're talking about there. Uh, and some additional pieces there for uh, for explaining the uh, the, uh, the, the the firmware and software that are being used on that uh, on that drive device. Uh, in endpoint, yeah, again, yeah, lots of uh, uh, lots of links here to CXL uh, and and the and the uh, the the remote memory uh, support that comes with it. Uh, again, here is the other one, uh, the other instance of, a, of of allowing you to configure external protocols. So, uh, you know, while Kafka is not a uh, uh, part of the Redfish standard, uh, you know, you can set up event destinations just like you can set up, uh, you know, event destinations of, of SN for SNMP traps. Uh, this also allows you to set up, uh, you know, a support for Kafka. Uh, the the more uh, the more important part of the of in in both event destination and event service uh, is this concept of severities. Uh, so uh, as we've tried to build uh, a fairly flexible uh, way for you to subscribe to, uh, you know, only the events. That that you care about, uh, allowing the service to present, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of potential events, uh, but not overwhelm, you know, clients that only care about specific pieces, uh, you know. And we we want folks to, uh, you know, to subscribe, you know, by 
message uh, uh, by message registry so you can get them effectively by topic. Uh, but one of the other ways to slice that uh, that traffic up is by severity. Uh, so you can uh, you can now subscribe to uh, you know to an event. Uh, that that it only matches uh, one of the three severity levels that are defined in Redfish. So it's it's a uh, it's uh, effectively the stoplights of of you know red red yellow or or green. Uh, and so if you just want to see critical events, uh, you can just subscribe to you know critical critical level severity, and then the uh, all everything else would be uh, uh, suppressed. Uh, and obviously the service has to also uh, uh, indicate that it supports uh, subscriptions using that form. Uh, uh, so that that is the, you see, you'll see the same piece there. So uh, going through the rest of this uh, page here, you see there's yeah more more of the MFA support, and so uh, the 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 bulk of the uh, multi-factor authentication support is handled in this in the configuration of for either uh, the account service or uh, in the uh, uh, excuse me in manager account or in the external account provider. Uh, and so this uh, particular object is is showing what how how you uh, allow an account. Uh, to bypass the uh, requirements set up for multi-factor authentication. Uh, and see, I'll just make a quick note that the links here in job, this is a, a, a basically a way for you to leave a breadcrumb in a completed job to say, hey, if this job was there to create uh, one or more new resources, uh, like, you know, like perhaps uh, perhaps creating a volume, uh, you know, out of a bunch of drives that may have taken a, a job to, to create. Uh, but once done, you can you can leave a, a, a an array of uh, links uh, to you know one or more resources that were created at, at when that job was completed. Uh, similar things here in, in, in more, more SSH support uh, sprinkled throughout. Uh, again, with you know CXL types uh, in license service uh, and in license, this is uh, a, so a little more flexibility to uh, to the install action to allow you to specify particular devices uh, or a particular target. So it gives some more granularity options uh, as we get more implementations uh, of the licensing service and try to bring. Uh, as much uh, as as much functionality as uh, as is known, uh, you know, to be able to model it within the standard. Uh, log entry has a new CXL uh, object type to, to effectively capture specific items for uh, CXL devices in a structured way, uh, as CXL has a lot of its own. Uh, you know, a logging format, so we basically wanted to uh, to to bring those in so that they can be uh, overloaded without having to to do particular OEM or or, or translate into text uh, and and to lose all that uh, uh, that that functionality or granularity. Uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, the uh, in memory, I'm not going to go into the details here, but the but a lot of pieces here for uh, for some of the more advanced pieces that are that are uh, being surfaced by by CXL devices and CXL memory. Uh, so you see quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of new properties there, uh, and especially some new actions that, that have to do with uh, you know with uh, the, the various configuration and and and, and uh, testing and state pieces. Uh, same thing as John pointed out, you know, between memory, memory chunks, and memory domains, lots of uh, lots of functionality added. Uh, but you know, we're we're super happy that the that the bulk of the CXL support was able to be incorporated into the models uh, by just adding a uh, you know new properties, and we really only created one new schema. So uh, so we're 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 real happy with the way that it has turned out that uh, uh, that we were able to add such a, a large amount of, of of new you know technical functionality without. Uh, without having to craft a, a lot of new separate resources. Uh, memory metrics. This is uh, continues to uh, to extend. Uh, you know, as as folks figure out uh, more uh, standard properties there for uh, for checking for uh, particular error counts. And and again, as the the types of devices become more sophisticated, those uh, th those uh, those counts will increase in numbers. Uh, as Mike uh, mentioned uh, about uh, uh, the uh, in the the uh, profile, uh, we have the same functionality in the message registry. So this is. Uh, the uh, uh, th this is a way for you to migrate uh, from OEM messages to standard messages that are now defined in the message registry uh, by showing uh, you know where what message is being you know that this message has been replaced by something uh, and then also giving uh, a uh, uh, this this construct of of a of a more specific message and I'll give an example here just to illustrate uh, we have a a, a, a 
uh, for instance, we have a, a, a drive removed uh, message. So that would, it, you know, that, that, and that's something the service would send if a, you know, if a drive has been removed from the system. Uh, there is also a resource state change message. Uh, and, and that then removing a drive would change the, uh, the state of that uh, of that drive resource from uh, from enabled to absent, as I mentioned earlier, so that's showing that it would be an empty drive bay. Uh, the the pattern that we're trying to steer folks towards uh, on on the service side is that uh, we want the service to emit both of those messages, uh, both that general message of of uh, resource state changed, but also the more specific message, which is probably more helpful to an end user of, you know, drive removed. Uh, but software may want to see both of those or more likely uh, particular software is caring about state changes. Other software may be displaying that information to the user. They would care about the uh, the drive, uh, you know, the drive removed message. Uh, so this is a way that we have documented in the registry to say that you know this uh, this drive removal message maps to that general uh, message of resource state changed, and so that can allow the service to to be aware of those uh, the, that linkage and then perhaps suppress them for particular clients. Uh, as I said, you know, more more CXL pieces uh, in PCI device and in uh, PCI function. Uh, uh, port, uh, I don't even remember what the PPB one action was, but Mike, if someone so could close it. CXL uh, type of action. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, and again, some more pieces uh, in, 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 uh, within the port for uh, uh, details around LLDP, some, some, uh, uh, you know, some minor additions there. Lost my cursor. There we go. Uh, yeah, again, more CXL pieces. Uh, you know, added a added a configurable user label uh, as we as we find more and more equipment that uh, that has the ability to you know, to have a Redfish interface. Uh, there's the the need for folks to be able to you know to effectively replace the uh, you know the good old Avery label stickers uh, that that go on lots of equipment and be able to make those uh, machine readable. So you'll see user label popping up uh, as uh, as we uh, as we flesh out the model more and more. Uh, Processor added actual power state as we have uh, processors that can can be individually you know, powered on and off. So we wanted to be able to indicate uh, those individually and not just as a state issue, but actually to show that it was a, a, a you know a truly powered off. Uh, let's see. Uh, one down. Yeah, the token piece that was the important part of the multi-factor authentication. So that's uh, provided as part of the session uh, as as the the post to create to, to create a session. Um, the, uh, the service route, this is, uh, this is another, um, important piece as we try to get, uh, uh you know, uh, the, sort of try to help automate, uh, some of the provisioning and the, the locating of equipment in the network. Uh, this is a link that, uh, provides a, uh, pointer from the service route to which manager resource in the Redfish model is actually providing the service. So especially in a in a large uh, multi multi enclosure chassis or like a bladed system that may have an enclosure manager with a bunch of managers underneath it, uh, you know it would be nice to know uh, you know where I, I need to go configure the actual Redfish service. So which of these dozen managers is the one who's actually providing that? Uh, and while you could go do some scanning and make some some uh, uh, some inference about uh, matching identifiers or, or other means, uh, gi giving a deterministic way to say, "Hey, this. Let me just give you a direct pointer uh, to show you who's who's running the show." All right, and last page. Uh, the uh, let's see, uh, software inventory. Uh, you know, we we have the we have software version, and uh, uh, but you know that that is a. Uh, uh, there's probably a million ways that, that, that have people have figured out uh, how to version their software. Uh, we certainly can't uh, lay down the law to say that you know that you need to do it uh, you know major minor and errata like we do. Uh, all that that would have been great, but uh, if, if we had that kind of authority, I would I would be doing something else. But uh, <laughs> so uh, what we did do was add another property called this uh, called version scheme, uh, and this uh, basically allows you to indicate uh, what's what scheme or what format is your 
uh, is your software version being reported? Uh, and so there are a few of these that have been uh, documented. Uh, and what this allows is, uh, is uh, you know, if you follow one of the known defined schemes, uh, then, you know, you can actually make comparisons from one version to another to, to, to help, uh, you know, explain to the user, uh, you know, whether the version they have is newer or older. Uh, and and by knowing that that uh, that you're following the rules of the of the scheme that is indicated, you know you can make that determination, you know, uh, with with uh, you know without uh, uh, making assumptions. Uh, so, uh, we, like I said, we can't make the world uh, all do it the one way, but if you follow at least uh, some of the known ways, uh, then you can make some you can make some deterministic uh, decisions. Uh, let's see. In storage, uh, more work uh, to uh, to support additional pieces around uh, around encryption. Uh, so you'll see a lot of the uh, a lot of those and both actions and the identifiers needed to to support those things. Uh, and then down through the rest of this, uh, you know, tasks same as the job about that created resources. Uh, and as Mike showed, uh, thermal metrics added the heater summary to to bring that the the the, the total amount of heat that's been. Uh, you know, the, how, how, how long has your heater been running uh, as a metric and then the thermal subsystem and, and uh, has the, the heaters pieces as, as previously shown. Uh, and then lastly, uh, on virtual media, there's the eject policy and eject timeout. This is uh, trying to surface uh, what are common implementation questions about, well, what happens uh, when you, uh, you know, when the session disconnects or what happens, uh, you know, when the system reboots, uh, you know, how, how is virtual media handled? Uh, and so various vendors have uh, various ways to, to do that. And so we want to at least uh, surface uh, that information so that, uh, that that folks that are writing scripts that take advantage of virtual media can, can know what's going to happen when we, you know, when various pieces happen and, and, and if they need to, you know, manually eject things or, uh, you know, or add more stuff to their scripts. Ah, all right. So <laughs> all that said, uh, we'll move on to the Q&A. And I know we have a couple questions here. Uh, and as we start the Q&A, uh, Shannon, if you can open that polling question, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and answer the, the, the first question that we received in the chat. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, so please, oh, and, and, uh, uh, as as Mike has uh, just informed you that the, that we have uh, open source tools available from the DMTF, both uh, both in the categories of conformance tools, uh, but also simple client and you know and end user you know, facing tools. Uh, so uh, we wanted to see what your uh, uh, what your awareness of those and and do you use any of those? Uh, and uh, and if you uh, if you did not know of those uh, before today, please yeah please indicate that you did not know. So uh, so we'll know if we were uh, if we were right that we needed to get the word out more. Okay, so now if we can see the results of that poll. Oh, good. All right. Well, we had some we had some awareness, and I see we have a smattering of, of folks that are using either the conformance tools uh, or our libraries uh, or the Tacklebox uh, command line scripts, and uh, you know, and at least uh, one person uh, that was not aware of those. So, uh, so yes, hooray, we've done our job to. Uh, to spread the word and uh, and for any of you uh, on the uh, on the call or listening in later, uh, if you're involved in any uh, uh, and I say Q and A, it's Q and A here. But if you're involved in any, any QA or testing uh, and want to code yourself a minivan, uh, there's a uh, <laughs> using using those conformance tools against uh, uh, against implementation can be a way for you to to score lots of uh, lots of points and bug reports. So. All right. Uh, so let's get to the to the Q and A. Uh, we have there's two questions, uh, or at least two. I see that we have in the in the chat here. Uh, so we'll answer those. Uh, so the first one from uh, from Neil's. Uh, you know, what's the preferred mechanism for non DMTF members uh, to report Redfish spec or schema problems? Uh, is it the forums? Uh, so I, I think first answer is is we will take uh, the feedback in any means uh, that you can get it to us. Uh, you know, we we absolutely want to take. Uh, you know any issues or concerns or uh, or requests for uh, you know enhanced functionality. We, we will take that in any form we can get it. Uh, the public forum, which uh, I'll have a link up here later, but yes, the public forum at redfishforum.com uh, is probably the the easiest uh, low lift way to get uh, information to us. Uh, we do uh, review every post that's made to that forum uh, every week and and try to respond as soon as we can. Uh, but we absolutely do take a look at those, and you you will. See 
see uh, a number of things that have shown uh, up in the, the releases uh, that are the direct result of, of folks giving us feedback. Uh, and certainly anything that's a problem uh, or, uh, with the spec or a bug, uh, we absolutely want to know that. And, uh, you know, as we do these releases, uh, you know, three to four times a year, uh, you're probably only uh, let's say, you know, on average, maybe 60 days uh, from, you know, from the next release, uh, we, we tend to turn things around pretty quickly uh, in, in the forum. So if it's a simple, a simple addition, uh, or if it's a bug, uh, we, we will try to get that fixed and, and pop those out in the next releases. So uh, this, this, is, this is not a multi-year process to get uh, things added or fixed. And Mike or John, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Or... Nope, uh, I think you covered everything uh, I, I would have. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, next question, and I hope John's still here because this uh, this is a CXL question. So uh, there's a, a one of the one of the attendees asks, uh, what was the thought process uh, putting memory domains outside of the PCIe and CXL device hierarchy? Uh, is it to simplify a schema, uh, the CXL device specs, or alignment with the software framework, or something else? Uh, are there considerations to put memory under the CXL device schema? Uh, if not, what's the reason? Sure. So um, I guess we could say that it was alignment with the software framework. The memory uh, domains uh, and memory chunks were um, already there under chassis for other fabrics, um, and we were aligning with that. Um, there are navigation links between um, the uh, physical PCIe uh, functions um, and the uh, memory that is presented by those functions. Um, so there, those are there. They may not have been depicted in the slide, um, but uh, they are linked between the two. So you can get from one to the other. I think as a more general modeling pattern comment uh, that uh, is worth mentioning is that when, when you start nesting resources underneath each other like that, you, you tend to uh, paint yourselves into a corner in terms of reuse of the model. And so that, yeah, as John said, the, the memory model for fabric attached memory and memory chunks is already in chassis. And so having that underneath CXL device means that you're now making all your general memory management use cases very CXL specific, which is something that, that we try to avoid. Yep, thanks for that addition, Mike. All right, uh, and just uh, note that you know that uh, if you if we want to get more in depth with uh, with the CXL stuff, we will be uh, we'll, we will be having a roundtable meeting uh, during, as soon as we finish here. Uh, so so please uh, stick around and and, and we will we will uh, go go into as much depth as you want. Uh, all right, now, uh, so next question: If there are multiple managers, this is from Neil. Uh, is it correct or appropriate uh, for there to be some sort of top level manager which coalesces the models under each of the sub managers? If so, is there guidance on whether the top level should just proxy or pass through to the sub level? Uh, so a great question, Neil. The, so the answer is that the Redfish model allows for either of those. And so uh, there's probably, uh, you know, uh, there's there's probably pluses and minuses to that, to each of those. And it, it's, I think it's going to really depend on uh, what your, what your product is and what you're trying to accomplish uh, and, and, you know, what it is that you're coalescing. So uh, the answer is you can do it either way. Uh, there is, uh, there's absolutely the concept of like a top level manager. So you'll see uh, the, the, there's some hierarchy uh, in the uh, in the in the uh, schemas for you know managers that are that are managed by other managers uh, and uh, and and vice versa. So you can show those relationships. Uh, and then as I showed at the you know at the root level, there's also the new property that can help you know give folks uh, a pointer to the you know to the top level guy that's providing the Redfish service. Um, the uh, the the data model as a whole was was absolutely intended to be able to be aggregated or to be able to resolve uh, multiple managers or multiples of, of any kind of device at a single IP address. So uh, the, the, the uh, prototype for that is a blade chassis and we have a, a public mock-up that shows that where, uh, where there's a, a, a chassis with, uh, I don't know what, how many were in the model, but let's just say there's a, you know, a dozen blades uh, that each have their own BMC in the traditional kind of uh, you know, uh, manager role. 
uh, but then there's an additional manager, you know, that would be called like an enclosure manager that is that is handling, uh, you know, larger devices and or sh sh shared infrastructure and so forth. Uh, and so the choice of whether you expose those individual blade managers uh, or if you just incorporate them into a model that just shows that uh, uh, I've got, you know, those sub managers or maybe those are just completely invisible. Uh, that's that's really up to you. Uh, and it it really goes to the what you know what is it that the customer is expecting uh, you know and and how how are uh, how are they going to interact with the devices and how much uh, how much of that is behind the scenes information and how much of it is is actually uh, something that the user needs to see uh, so uh, it's it's probably a we can get into some more discussion about it but the uh, I think that the short the short answer since I didn't give that already uh, is uh, you know, it's absolutely correct and appropriate to have a top level manager. Uh, and really, I think the choice comes to the, you know, do you want to expose all the details underneath? Uh, or do you want to give, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, minimal aspects of those, maybe, maybe, a, a, you know, a, a reduced set of information? Uh, or do you just want to uh, pass through all that stuff and just say, I'm just going to go ask uh, that sub manager and just relay the answers and, and, and effectively proxy. So yeah, the, both, both of those are valid. And, and I think absolutely will depend on really how tightly coupled uh, you are uh, with those with those things that you're managing, or uh, or also uh, you know if you're truly a, like an aggregator, if, you, if you're not in total control of those devices, your your uh, your answer may differ. So, Mike, anything to add? Or I've, I think I've covered a lot of it. <laughs> no, that's uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. It's a very open ended problem. We don't have a uh, we don't really have guidance other than whatever makes the most sense for for whatever it is you're building. Okay. Yeah. And you know, thanks for again, confirming that. And uh, uh, that, that you know, the, long, the long answer of what you're trying to do with the blade example is what you're trying to wrangle. So great. Uh, okay. And so we have a few other uh, CXL questions in the queue here. So John, I uh, hope you're hope you're ready. Uh, so for CXL devices, are Redfish APIs being developed to manage memory regions dynamically? Uh, for example, memory flush allocate memory from CPU one to another CPU two. Uh, if so, are these only in-band or also out-of-band calls? Sure, I can answer that. So there is work going on to develop um, managing management of memory regions dynamically. There's still work going on in the Fabrics Task Force associated with that. Um, about the uh, examples that you're showing, those sound very host-specific. Um, and uh, there are... Uh, commands that CXL provides to uh, work with the device, um, the logical device that was assigned to it. So I don't know if we're going to get into that level. That would be up to the host. Um, but the the ones that we're working on right now are, um, you know, uh, allocating memory from uh, host one to host two versus CPU one to CPU two on a specific host. Um, so there are uh, in band calls for the host to work with the uh, device that it has. Um, and their out of band calls um, would come from a fabric manager that would work with um, uh, uh, multiple hosts uh, in a shared environment. Good, thanks, John. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, and 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 hold on though, because we've got uh, we have one more uh, CXO related question. So. Uh, another uh, another participant asks, uh, uh, for OEMs working with CXL devices, is there a recommended partner to co-develop and validate CXL-related Redfish APIs? Yeah, I don't know like, if, how I can comment on the recommended partner. I would suggest you know talking with the CXL consortium, um, as well as um, you know, in terms of specifically validating CXL-related Redfish APIs. I'm not sure if the DMTF does oh, well, that kind do, of work. Well, we do have the the general conformance tools that can do some validation, but the the end-to-end -end functional validation. There, I mean, there's there's always a, a, a chance that we we could have uh, functional testing. Uh, we we've done some of that with our use case checkers, but it hasn't grown that much. So it, it's entirely possible that if we can uh, agree on common CXL workflows. Uh, we could add that to to use as a use case checker. Yeah, as a as a standards group, we we are completely agnostic as to as to vendors 
uh, but uh, but I would certainly say that uh, you know the, one of the quick first questions to ask those vendors is uh, are are they are they aware of and do they do they test and pass uh, all the redfish conformance tests because that's uh, that's our first indication for uh, for folks that uh, that have <laughs> that are doing their homework. So <laughs> yeah, so I would recommend taking that question to the uh, CXL consortium. Okay, uh, and one, uh, one more question coming. So for CXL, I assume, uh, again for Neil, uh, for CXL, I assume that Redfish Composition Service is the intended way to compose up uh, processor and memory, et cetera? Maybe, it, it kind of depends on what level of composability you're looking for. Uh, the Composition Service can get you the very high level types of orchestration to say, please assign this resource to this, to this system. And, and underneath the covers, whatever is taking that request may in turn be doing other Redfish calls to do the lower order fabric manipulation. So actually going off to other Redfish services and say, well, I need to configure this routing on these switches. I need to create these new memory chunks. I need to do this, that, and the other thing in the fabric model to establish connections to hosts. So they can play well together. Um, but maybe as a first pass, you might just start with the, the lower order work to do the, the more manual fabric manipulation and build on that to do a more intelligent uh, composition service. Good. <laughs> Glad, Great. Glad yeah, yeah, Neil, 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 Neil. <laughs> thanks, thanks for confirming. So, uh, okay. Uh, all right, uh, that 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 is all the questions we have in the queue, and I hope you've uh, folks that are on I've, are still uh, still have a few more that uh, you can carry over to the roundtable. Uh, so uh, before we get to roundtable, uh, just uh, just we'll finish up here. Uh, first thing is uh, is and and Shannon will will poke this up before you before you leave and and we, we head over to roundtable. Please do fill out the the survey uh, for this webinar. Uh, and this one we've had a great Q and A session, so. I uh, was hap happy to see that we had uh, a lot of participation there, uh, and uh, this also was a uh, quite quite a bit of material we had to go through. So, uh, so uh, you know, but just to to finalize uh, here, you know, to, to how to get involved with Redfish, and that was certainly one of the questions that that came up there about uh, you know how to provide feedback. So, lots of ways to be involved uh, if you're just looking for all the the. The, the materials that we've talked about today, uh, the the one stop shop is the Redfish Developer Portal. So that's redfish.dmtf.org, uh, as shown right here. Uh, from there, you can get to everywhere else that uh, that 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 we have on this uh, page, and, and really every, everything that's available from the DMTF uh, regarding Redfish is linked from here. So that you can always start there. Uh, the rest of these are then the the you know the major uh, major items of work. So the, the all of the standard all of our uh, work products, uh, you know, everything published from the DMTF is all listed on the standards page at dmtf.org, you know, slash standards slash redfish. Uh, the public user forum, uh, as, as I said, we, you know, we, we do review all the posts uh, that are made on the forum uh, and try to give as much uh, answers as we can and uh, take, uh, you know, take any bug reports or uh, uh, or minor suggestions and, and take those back to the group for, for discussion and inclusion. And you know, you will see uh, several cases in there where, where, where feedback has been taken and, and shows up in the next version of the specifications. Um, for for uh, effectively non-trivial amounts of feedback, if you have ideas for new schemas, uh, and this is kind of how things like the the alliance partnership with CXL was also developed this way, uh, for you know for for uh, you know major pieces of work that you would like us to uh, consider, uh, there's the the DMTF feedback portal is where is is where that is uh, made uh, as a contribution, uh, and that's done for uh, you know for all the the legalese uh, you know intellectual property and uh, and copyright uh, you know involvements, uh, and so that's why that's why that process is there, uh, and uh, and finally uh, you know if you if if you're uh, if even if you're an end user, uh, you know, if you have a lot of work going on with Redfish, uh, you know, actually joining the DMTF and being part of the forum, uh, we've we've had uh, we've had a number of folks join recently, and and having you know, a lot of active discussions now with uh, folks that are uh, that are active end users and are relying on it to to manage and and control their infrastructure. So uh, we love to have that feedback and and. Uh, uh, and all that involvement. So, so that said, lots of ways to get involved. Uh, and uh, with that, if you'll make sure you finish, fill out your survey, uh, and then that uh, uh, that brings us to the end of the webinar for today. Uh, Shannon's going to give you a link 
that you probably already have an email if you had already registered, if you had pre-registered for the uh, webinar, uh, but we're placing a link in the chat now uh, to, to, to join us uh, for a, an active roundtable discussion on a different Zoom call. Uh, and with that, uh, that concludes uh, the webinar for today. Uh, Mike uh, and uh, special guest John, uh, thank you all uh, for helping us out today. And, uh, uh, and everyone, have a, uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.